Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. For today's episode, we're really excited to bring on Jared Halverson. Jared is an associate professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University and has taught religion courses at the high school and college level since 1998. He studied history and religious education at BYU and earned a PhD in American religious history at Vanderbilt University, focusing on secularization, faith loss, and anti-religious rhetoric. He's frequently involved with interfaith dialogue and has been featured as a speaker in both devotional and academic settings across the country. He also hosts a popular YouTube channel and podcast called Unshaken. We're also really excited that Jared will be speaking at Restore, Faith Matters Gathering taking place in October. You can find out more about that at faithmatters.org slash restore. We brought Jared on to talk about a really important concept that he sometimes calls proving contraries, and it's something that we've talked a little bit about on the podcast before using the term polarities. He talked with us about how recognizing these polarities can help us understand our own strengths and weaknesses, how attributes that are positive taken too far almost always become problematic, and how wrestling with contraries is essential in a life full of growth and meaning. We're super excited for you to hear this, and we're so grateful to Jared for his insights and willingness to come on and talk with us. We really hope that you enjoy this conversation. All right, Jared Halverson, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you on. Oh, so good to be here with you too. Um, we, so what, what we want to talk about today is this concept that you've been uh, sort of a leading voice on recently, which is proving contraries. There's a lot of different ways to say this. Mm-hmm. Um, you gave a devotional recently in a stake, was it in Alpine? Uh, Highland. Oh, Highland, um, where you talked about this. But I wanted to, before we uh, dive into proving contraries, I wanted to talk about a point that you made right at the beginning, mm-hmm. which you said, when people come to you with faith challenges, you often come back to two principles, one being stages of faith and the other being proving contraries. Yep. So why the, why those two? And we'll just spend a second maybe if that's okay oh, yeah, on great, stages yeah, of faith. Question, and then we'll great question. Great question. Honestly, I do it. I go to those two because they're the two most relevant, uh, most applicable to almost every situation I find the person in. So often they come with a specific question. And I want to be able to address that specific question. So we'll talk about pl- plural marriage or we'll talk about race and the priesthood or we'll talk about whatever it is that's on their mind. But so often doubt is like whack-a-mole uh, <laughs> and it'll pop up one place and then you'd think that one's under control and it'll pop up somewhere else because sometimes it's an epistemological problem. How do I come to grips with what I know or thought I knew? And so to give them some things that hopefully will be helpful, not just in that moment, but moving forward. Uh, and so... To me, the stages of faith model, which is so helpful, whether it's Fowler's three, four, and five, or Elder Hafen's complexity, or simplicity, complexity, simplicity on the other side of complexity, uh, Thomas McConkie's great work on this. There's so many models that are healthy and helpful there. And as I've, to me, it's it can be simplified just to be creation fall atonement. Yeah, I hadn't mm-hmm. heard that language applied to it before. Yeah. It's really interesting. And and to me, there's those pillars of eternity. That's the story arc of basically every book you've ever read or every movie you've ever seen. That to help people navigate this and see themselves, usually they're in that fall stage. And to give them hope that we of all people should understand the fortunate fall. Uh, that this is downward and they feel that and sense that or other people are kind of piling it on that you've moved downward spiritually. Mm -hmm. And yet like you've moved forward intellectually. You've often moved forward spiritually as well. Uh, But that has been incredibly helpful for people just to feel seen and understood. And okay, I'm not as far off the path as yeah. I thought. In fact, maybe I'm not off the path at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but also to see, to recognize the, the value of where they are, but also the value of where they were and trying to combine the two as they strive to move forward. And to me, that's where proving contraries uh, intersects with, with uh, stages of faith. Yeah. Because in some ways with the idea of proving contraries, which we'll spend our time today talking about, uh, the contrary is taking the benefits of stage one spirituality, combining them with the benefits of stage two spirituality. And the beauty of that is Stage one, off, the positives of stage one offset the negatives of stage two and vice versa. And by combining the two, that's how you move on to stage three. That's how you climb the ascent to the atonement. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. A lot of times developmental uh, experts will use the phrase transcend and include, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. it's not just transcend. It's not throw out stage exactly. one for the sake of stage two. Right. I think that was one of McConkie's best yeah. contributions to the discussion, that exact concept. Yeah, yeah. totally. And, and it gives you, I love that it just really gives you peace of mind because I think when you're in the fall stage, 
it feels like you feel frantic, like mm -hmm. just to get back. And so it may feel better to you want to retrench and get back to the garden because yeah. that's the safe place that, you know, and I love that all of those frameworks have this forward motion. That exactly. it, it feels like development looks like moving through this, not trying to go back. Well, and I think that's why cherubim and the flaming sword exist. And there's that wow. you can't come back here. But then there's this contrary, because on the one hand, you have cherubim and the flaming sword saying, don't go backwards. But you also have altar and angel saying, please go forward. And let me let me help you understand why this is actually a good thing that, that's happened. And let's help you progress from here. Wow, wow, that's beautiful. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, honestly, and and I hope that I think we're sensing it, which is why we're having this discussion. And I hope that your listeners will sense it as well. Once you start to see, once the concept clicks, you start seeing it everywhere. You'll, you'll see contraries throughout your scripture study. They pop up all over the place. You'll see it just in, in life. Uh, I had one student uh, text me and said, I had a dream last night that we were in, in, in a class together and somebody made a point and I said, oh, that's a great point. But there's a contrary here that needs to be proven. And he just laughed. He said, I'm even dreaming about contraries. I said, okay, there we have another, another convert to contraries. That's yeah. good. Could you, could you talk about where the phrase proving contraries comes from you bet. and what it, what it means? So Joseph Smith, near the very end of his life, uh, coined the, the phrase. Uh, he simply said that by proving contraries, truth is made manifest. Uh, it's funny because in some ways, I don't even know if he fully knew what he was saying there. Because if you look at it in context, and he didn't explain what he meant. Uh, there, was all kind, there were all kinds of difficulties that he was dealing with. And uh, the presidential election of 1844 and trying to balance North and South and all these kinds of things. And so many options out there. And so the suggestion on his part was we've got to prove these contraries, take these opposite ideas and, and compare them. Well, uh, in the work that I've done trying to make sense of a bigger concept of proving contraries, I think it goes far beyond anything Joseph intended with the simple phrase. Because like I said, he doesn't, he doesn't go deep and explain it. And I think in some ways, if he were listening in, he'd think, what, is, that, is that what I said? Wow, that's pretty <laughs> yeah. good. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's more than just let's look at both sides of the issue. I think there's something a lot more to this. And but, but I love the phrase, and I think for, for Latter-day Saint listeners, it's a, a good chance to take some, a, a phrase from the prophet Joseph and, and add that to our, our repertoire, add, add that to our vocabulary, because the concept is found through so many traditions and, and philosophies and ideas. It's, like I said, once, once it clicks, you'll see it everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Would you talk about some of the places that you see this showing no, up? You bet. You bet. So when, as I try to help my students make sense of it, first of all, the, the word contrary can be difficult because it's not a word that we use. We would typically use a word like paradox. In fact, Terrell Givens wrote a book on Mormon culture and called it People of Paradox. And the first half of that book deals with, I think, four different sets of contraries. Like, how can it be this and this? And so a paradox is this seemingly self-contradictory or... Uh, mutually exclusive set of propositions. And yet, once you get deeper into them, you realize, wait, these two actually can hold together in some kind of active tension. Uh, the, the, I, was, I was trying to help my students understand there's the word contrary is an old one. Uh, Abraham Cowley was a British writer uh, who wrote to Thomas Hobbes uh, in the 1600s and said, so contraries on Etna's top conspire, here hoary frosts and by them breaks out fire. And so he's just I, this little couplet about the top of Mount Etna that how can, when I mean, you picture a volcano, but there's ice up there and snow up there and yet fire, how's that possible? Yeah. And so this idea of contraries. But digging deeper, Niels Bohr, Danish physicist, said the opposite of a fact is, the opposite of a fact is a falsehood, but the opposite of one profound truth may very well be another profound truth. Uh, and again, even from a physics perspective, you look at light, is it a, is it a particle? Is it a, uh, a wave? Which, you know, like it's both. And, and how do these reconcile? Uh, Simone Weil was a French philosopher. She said, as soon as we have thought something, try to see in what way the contrary is true. So she even used the word. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the world stands by balanced antagonisms. I love mm. that. So these, they're antagonistic. How this, this one, doesn't it kick out the other? Well, no, somehow they balance one another. Uh, John Stuart Mill, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and so to me, it's a good caution, even in my own experience, whether religiously or politically or philosophically, if I feel really convinced of one side of an issue, I start getting nervous and looking around for my blind spot uh, and what's the contrary on the other side that helps balance things. 
Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Uh, I mean, in, in Chinese philosophy, you get the yin-yang. And that's a set of contraries. How do the two combine? Well, they combine to help balance one another. Uh, in ph European philosophy, uh, Hegelian dialectics is this concept of you take one idea and that's the, the thesis, but then you force it to interact with its opposite. There's the antithesis. And somehow combining the two, you get the synthesis. And it's that synthesis where you finally have this breakthrough. Uh, I mean, it's an old concept. Hegel was, was building off of Socrates and, or uh, yes, the Socratic method and Aristotle, trying to make sense of pushing back against one person's concept or idea with its opposite until you find some kind of greater truth. And so I just, I see it everywhere. Even if you, if you don't want to go back to ancient Greece, Brene Brown, how's that? She's <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the patron saints in, of our day. <laughs> yeah. She said, only the paradox comes anywhere near to comprehending the fullness of life. Mm. And so I, I just, there are so many thinkers and so many writers and, and philosophers trying to make sense of life. And there's so much truth on both sides of most issues that somehow we have to learn to, to combine them. Yeah. One, one of my favorite thinkers on this is G.K. Chesterton. He was an early 20th century Catholic writer and thinker. And they, some called him the Prince of Paradox because he talked about this. And in the context of trying to defend Christianity from, from its uh, attackers or detractors, he talked about Christianity being this fusion of opposites, furious opposites is what he called them, and allowing both to stay together and to stay furious. Mm -hmm. Now he talked about the cross as the symbol of Christianity. And at the center of the cross is a collision and contradiction. Mm -hmm. And so there's this vertical component fused with this horizontal component and and that's how we find our balance. Yeah, and I'm so, thinking about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just in Latter-day Saint scripture, um, you know, there's Lehi in the earlier mm -hmm. chapters of the Book mm -hmm. of Mormon saying there needs to be opposition in all things. Yep. And even in Doctrine and Covenants, you have the voice of Christ saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, it's sort of like bringing exactly. that in. Well, the Alpha and Omega is a beautiful one. Yeah, how, how is he both beginning and end? Exactly. He's the beginning of so many beautiful things and the end of so many hard things. And even when, and this is one Chesterton deals with, Christ as lion and lamb is a beautiful mm. contrary because his point was, if we just think the lion's going to lie down next to the lamb and do nothing, then the lamb, he said, that's a horrible usurpation on the part of the lamb. He just devoured the lion instead of the lion devouring the lamb. And so to combine the two, you look, you see in Revelation 5, where the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book with the seven seals. Someone that could roar down death and hell. And as we look for that figure, Instead, we're shown a lamb as if it were slain. And so, wait, I thought you said a lion was going to do this. Oh, yeah, there he is. What, that's a lamb. Uh-huh. And so the, the fact that Jesus can be both. I, I do want to push back just uh, uh, gently against Lehi on this. Sure. Uh, no, no, I love Lehi, so no offense. Uh, but it's not. <laughs> I'll pass your not, complaints <laughs> back to Lehi. Yeah. I don't, it's not. Ex I, I, the opposition in all things is a great phrase, uh, and it does apply in this context. But the way that Lehi was dealing with it was good and evil. And there needs to be the bitter so that you can sense the sweet. There needs yeah. to be evil so you recognize the good and prize the good. You need to, in fact, the way it's, it's described, you need to taste, internalize, metabolize bitterness so that you can prize things that are sweet. It's experiential, right? But the, to me, the importance of, the one difference that needs to be emphasized here is that when it comes to contraries, it's, I call them polar positives. They're both, they're both not just necessary, but they're both good. Mm -hmm. And, and I wouldn't say that evil is good in terms, mm -hmm. it's, it's necessary, but we call it a necessary evil because it's necessary and it's evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so in some ways, when I look at things like justice and mercy, ah, uh, justice is a good uh, and mercy is a good, but and I want more justice and I want to be more merciful, but I, I want to be more good. I don't want to be more evil. So, yeah. so that's one. one that makes sense. That's an important distinction. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's where we can go. I thought it was really helpful to when you kind of walk through how to discover a contrary. And that's mm -hmm. the so you, you talk about how, you know, if you take justice to the nth degree, uh -huh. then you're Javier, like yeah. you're yeah. you're or Javier. Javier. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> Javier. <laughs> we might need to <laughs> You can't. Edit that That's part. great. That's great. You need to be <laughs> Juan Bel Juan. <laughs> 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 
Hey, it, it was translated in English for us. I mean, maybe that's his name in the, in the Spanish version of Les Miserables. I'm sure it is. Juan, Los Miserables. Juan. Los Miserables. Sí. <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, okay, what no, did they say? Crazy. You take just <laughs> no, but no, but you're exactly right. As I okay. tried to explain, of any you say virtue, it. You say no, the whole no, thing. No, You'll let you use the as example. <laughs> a virtue taken to the extreme typically becomes a vice. Well, the, so you take this virtue like justice, like Javert, uh, and you put it to the extreme. That's when Javert really comes in. That it can't handle anything that detracts from it, and and all of a sudden your justice, which is a good trait, trait becomes judgmentalness it becomes overly be, you're overly harsh and and unbending and and that's no way to live but the opposite oh well let's be merciful okay great yes let's be merciful but to be to push mercy to the extreme uh, i asked a class what's once what is mercy on steroids and one young woman said codependence whoa and it, yeah <laughs> that, i had the same the same reaction just wow that's yeah and I wondered if there was some personal experience behind that insight on her part. There's, and so needing both, you see it in Ether 1227, famous verse that our weak things can become strengths through mm -hmm. the atonement of Christ. But Elder Oaks said that our strengths can become our downfalls. And so here you have these, this attribute that has a heads and a tails and can flip back and forth. And how do I keep those things in, in proper, in proper perspective well we keep it in proper balance yeah, yeah and, and i love that because needed. because a lot of times i think you know when we have a strength we want to lean all the way into mm -hmm. it and just and live out that strength all the way because it's good so why not more good you know exactly. like let's just do that more and bigger well, so, and, that, and that's what's so insidious about you, you picture the adversary we think of him playing to our weaknesses which he does yeah but this is a chance for him to play into our strengths where he can say oh yeah that's a good thing so yeah, yeah develop more of it lean into that and when we think of the angel and the devil on the shoulders, in some ways, the devil doesn't even have to show up because he can have just leave the angel there. And as long as there's no angel oh, wow. on the other side, then you will fall to the, the vice side yeah, of that virtue. That totally makes and, sense. And we'll feel totally justified in being that. Because we know it's a virtue. Because we know it's good. Because it is good. Exactly. Because it is good. Exactly. So what's the difference between synthesis and finding a, a a truth and just compromise like are, like what's the difference between what you're saying and just like always finding the exact middle well because sometimes finding the middle is i sometimes call it the mushy middle where you've eliminated both sides to just to try to find some some weird middle ground and i don't think that's what, what proving countries is about it's mm -hmm. not eliminating both extremes it's allowing both of them to be present to to balance each other out and to help us move along the spectrum between them based on the circumstances we find ourselves in. Because there, there are times where we need the lion and there are times we need the lamb. There are times in life that we have been overly indulgent with ourselves and we need the justice verses of scripture to wake us up and call us to repentance. That makes sense. But there are other times where we are too harsh and too hard on ourselves and we need the mercy of Christ to to come through to reassure us that all that we're okay and we can move forward, and so it's not just a matter of forget justice and forget mercy. It's hold the two. I sometimes say to my students when you're walking the tightrope or the balance beam, it's so narrow that well, do we put our arms down at our sides mm -hmm. so we can be just as narrow as the path we're trying to walk? No, we we extend our arms as far as we possibly can because there's. There's something about holding to both extremes. Christ was perfectly just and could afford to be because he was perfectly merciful at the same time. And if he can answer the ends of the law, that is, is Alma uses the phrase of, of giving full sway to these complementary uh, Christ-like attributes. And so it's, it's not a compromise so much as it is a, a combining of the two and giving full free reign to both sides and knowing in the moment, which do I need to lean into? Yeah. yeah. One, we... one, well, I was going to say one polarity that really helped me kind of navigate this when I was trying to like just as an exercise sort of walk through what this actually looks like was um, courage and caution. Because mm -hmm. that's one Fair like much. you don't want to be a five on courage always and a five on caution always. Like totally. that that was easy to see how that's equally problematic. Yeah you know, as being all of only one. And, but 
but I can see how having those imbalance and being being totally courageous and totally cautious is the healthiest way to walk through your through, walk through your life. Like it's a way well, to live out both of them exactly well, without allow, just like a strict compromise. Exactly, you know? and it allows you to be situation specific. Yeah, right? yeah, in, yeah. In this moment, I need to be cautious, or in this moment, it's c courage has to reign. Yeah. And I think by developing both sides, we've we're we're ready to move in either direction as mm -hmm. the as the circumstances demand. Yeah. yeah. So is that the answer to? So I was thinking more about. Uh, Les Mis and I, like wondering if we truly can be as you were talking like can we truly be radically merciful I'm thinking about the priest mm -hmm. who not only forgives the theft of the silverware but offers the, the candlesticks mm -hmm. you know um, but also I have bought your soul for God <clears throat> yes you know and it's that it's the mercy of the priest that allows Jean Valjean to respond to the justice of I have to, I mean there's no uh, there's no going and confessing his his crimes without the justice that the priest's mercy allows him to demand. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, the, to me, there's something profound. That that book's a great example of of trying to balance justice and mercy, and it's personified by different people. But I think that's a great, a great yeah. point. Tim. Yeah, cool. Um, what what other of these? You go through so many. I'd love mm -hmm. for you to highlight a few of the contraries that you. Um, that uh, I don't know that resonate most with you. That yeah, maybe you that. see in the Latter Day Saint culture that we mm -hmm. could do better with. Oh like that. yeah, this that that could take hours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the justice and mercy one is the one that is it makes sense to us because we're all familiar with the story of the woman taken in adultery, and that Jesus, the, the fact that the the scribes and Pharisees come and try to pit the those polarities against each other. Uh, assuming that Jesus is only going to be able to pick one of them and he's either going to condemn her, in which case we'll condemn him, or or he'll condone her actions, in which case we'll condemn him as well. And for him to be able to to walk that middle line and and do complete honor to both justice and mercy, neither do I condemn you. There's mercy speaking. Go and sin no more. There's justice speaking. And, and they all leave, oh, how did he do that, mm -hmm. right? Well, he did it by proving contraries. Uh, the faith and works or grace and law is another way to say it, is a, a foundational one in our doctrine. And, and not just an LDS doctrine. It's interesting. If you read the New Testament epistles of Paul, there are, I can't remember, eight or nine different God forbid statements. And it's amazing to watch what Paul is doing with those God forbid statements. Because so often he's trying to help legalists move in the direction of grace. And then as he starts to feel the center of gravity shift and worries that they're going to overcorrect, mm -hmm. then he says, now, does this mean that we can just pile on our, our sins and put it on Jesus's tab? Go, oh, God forbid. And he brings it back. Uh, but then as it swings back, does that mean this? Well, no, God forbid. And so to me, Paul's God forbid statements are almost like bumper bowling, uh, where I'm trying, I don't want a gutter ball on either, on either side of the lane. Uh, and I actually had a great, I do a lot of interfaith work, especially among evangelical Christians and got some great friends that are evangelical pastors. And, and we had a great conversation once as we talked about faith and, or grace and works and where that balance is, because you get a James saying faith without works is dead. But Elder Oaks also said, yeah, but works without faith is deader. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can, some people try to pit Paul against James, but in some ways you could pit Paul against Paul with those God forbid statements. And, and he's trying to help us navigate that. Anyway, I, I shared this example with my evangelical pastor friend that I really do feel that the, our two faith communities can walk down the sidewalk hand in hand. The question is, which side of the sidewalk are we more comfortable on? And I shared this example of, when I go on walks with my wife, I'm frequently switching back and forth from her left side to her right side and just which hand am I holding? And the difference is if there's oncoming traffic, I want to be on the on the, the road side because I don't want I'd rather get hit than have her get hit. The, my, and my kids would back me up on that. I'm the expendable parent. Uh, but on the other hand, literally, if there is a dog in a yard, then I'm going to quickly switch to that side. Because she's deathly afraid of dogs in yards. And so uh, I'd rather get eaten before she does. <laughs> and so it's this idea of which is the greater fear factor in any given moment. And I think with the evangelical Christian community and the Latter-day Saint community, as we're, I think we're so much closer than either party wants to admit. And, and evangelicals sometimes accuse Latter-day Saints of works righteousness and trying to earn our way to heaven. Meanwhile, Latter-day Saints sometimes accuse evangelical Christians of 
of cheap grace or sloppy agape, if you want to go with the Greek, <laughs> uh, and just put it on Jesus's tab and mm -hmm. presume upon his grace to borrow, borrow Paul's phrase. And, and honestly, what I think is happening, because even, Christ, even evangelical Christian theologians and scholars are concerned that we don't want our community to fall off the end on that side. And Latter-day Saints don't want to fall off on the side of works righteousness either. But I think there's a common concern, but a different fear. And so I think Latter-day Saints are deathly afraid of laziness and presuming upon on God's grace. And so we're active and we, we serve and we try to live obedient lives and so on because we're afraid of the dog on that side of the sidewalk. Meanwhile, evangelicals are scared to death of oncoming traffic, namely pride and thinking that we have done something in the equation of salvation. Mm. And, and to me, it's a matter of, can we agree we're both concerned about both sides of the sidewalk? And we really can walk hand in hand. And so I think the faith and works one uh, is deep, especially in the New Testament. Yeah. In, in Latter-day Saint culture, I, I think that's uh, super relevant. I, I also mentioned to you that uh, in texting Thomas McConkie prior to this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, prior to this interview, he mentioned that doing and being mm -hmm. is one that that he the found potentially really relevant, and I think it's very related to, to oh, totally. faith and works, right? But how do you uh, well, how, I, how do you think I, about that it's one? It's a great one. I, I'll often write on the board Temple W, then blank, and ask my students fill in the blank, and invariably they'll fill it in with O R K. Temple yeah, work. I, just temple did, work. I did too. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and that's it, because it's work, and that's what we do. And how do we define our discipleship? We're active. Oh, mm -hmm. there's the doing, right? And, and again, we love our James faith that that works is dead. Uh, but I've pointed out also, erase the O-R-K and put O-R-S-H-I-P. Mm. And how about temple worship? Where does that come in? And you can tell which side we're on if you stay in the celestial room of the temple and watch how long people stay. Because as they, to me, it's tragic that they'll... It took us an hour and a half to get here, yeah, for crying out loud, right. right? It takes me that long just to slow down the mind and get to a place where I can shift from doing to being. And then to be in the celestial room. I mean, no wonder uh, Thomas McConkie is, is bringing this one up because to me, the celestial room is our most meditative, contemplative, yeah. mindful. It's the it's the Buddhist core of, of the restored gospel, you know? It's <laughs> And that's our place of highest holiness. And so you do all this doing so you can come to a place where you can truly be. Yeah. And, and again, don't overcompensate or overcorrect and just shift like, oh, I've been doing too much and I haven't been being. So let me stop doing and only be. And that's not what, what we're after either. It, it, it's tricky, but that's the balance the Lord is trying to get us to strike. Yeah, yeah that's that. a really good one. Now, there, okay. there's, I'm just amazed how many there are. I mean, I know, just so to, many. Throw, to throw out a few, yeah, do we don't, more. I mean, if any of them you want to talk about, we can. But okay. to look at God and how we view God, to me, that's the contrary of the infinite and the intimate. Mm. Mm. That he is so transcendent and so far above us. But the fact he would condescend to reach out and answer our prayers and, and be a part of our lives, to me, is profound. And too often, I remember a student saying, that her father had said, there are times in your prayers. She said she had felt too far away from God with the these and thous in her prayers and was more focused on grammar than on God. Uh, did I say that correctly? And her father said, "If it's okay to call him dad sometimes. Uh, Jesus did both. J at one point, Jesus calls him Abba, which is so intimate. But another time he calls him Eli, my God, which is so transcendent and formal. And so to see the infinite and the intimate in God and at any given moment, which is he to us? Our own self-perception, there's the dust and divinity divide that Moses has just been told in Moses 1, you're a son of God created after the image of my only begot. And then when he's dropped off after the, the epiphany, it's man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. And how do I balance both of those? There's an old Jewish story of a rabbi that had a, a piece of paper in each pocket. And one of them said, for you, the, the heavens and earth were created. And the other says, you are but dust and ashes. And the key for this rabbi was knowing which piece of paper to pull out at any given time. There's agency and inspiration, which we can talk about more if you'd like. Yeah, let's do. I actually really do. I yeah. really appreciated that one. Yeah. Well, the, to me, the, it's I mean, how do we make our decisions? Right. Uh, and to me, the agency on one side, but inspiration on the other. I love 
I remember once reading the Doctrine and Covenants in one sitting. It was a long Sunday, but I just wanted to watch the in one sitting. Yeah, to, I wanted to watch the <laughs> the restoration unfold like time lapse photography. Wow. wow! And so 138 sections, just boom, 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 boom. And by going that fast, you start seeing sh gradual shifts that you would miss if you went revelation by revelation. And one thing that blew me away was this gradual shift from inspiration to agency through the course mm -hmm. of the revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants. Early on, it's so much more inspiration. Thus saith the Lord and thou shalt, and this is what you're supposed to do. I'm, I'm telling you because you don't understand it quite yet. But then as time goes on, it becomes more of a, it is expedient in me, which is still kind of, this is what you're supposed to do, but it's a little softer than thou shalt and I command. But then keep going, it becomes more, it is wisdom in me. So less expediency and more, well, I think this is a good idea and I am omniscient, you know. Uh, but then you go on from there and it's the power is in you. You are an agent unto yourself. You know, bring to pass much righteousness uh, or even to the point of north, south, east, west, it mattereth not, you cannot go amiss. I'm going to totally leave this with you. I mean, the brother of Jared's a great example of it. I'm going to go inspiration with the air, but agency with the light. Mm -hmm. and And how do we strike that balance? And so... I, I see it among young adults, my students, as they're deciding on what to be when they grow up or who to, who to get married to. And, and so often it's a matter of, I only want inspiration on this one because I'm scared to death of messing up my agency. And, and that's an abdication that God doesn't want to allow. And so we've got to do a better job of balancing yeah. that. There's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a related one that maybe you maybe could term like control and acceptance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, both the desire and the need to take responsibility for yeah. our lives and our decisions mm -hmm. and um, and not blame others, make excuses and sort of like, you know, have have a real strong sense of control, but also recognize that in many ways, things are completely outside our control. Yeah. And the only way I think to find peace in, in many situations is to accept what is presented to us. Oh, exactly. Uh, otherwise, and again, this is one of the things that helps me see where a contrary is needed. If I take one side that I feel good about, and it's usually the one I'm wired for, it's my natural strength, uh, put it on steroids, push it to the extreme. Do you still want to be that person, right? And, and that's when it, it wakes me up. Oh, yikes, I don't want that. So I need to start looking for its opposite, its polar positive, to see how can, by being anchored over on this side, it keeps me from drifting too far in that side and vice versa. And the one you're describing there, I see it sim a similar, an echo of that in, in Jacob, where Jacob says, because of faith and great anxiety, it was truly given us to know what to do for our people. And faith and anxiety, there is this sense of what can I control versus it's totally out of my control. Yeah. And I think there are people that are have too much faith and not enough anxiety. And they think oh, it's all God's got this taken control of and, and, and it's all in hand and it'll be fine. And I don't do much on my end. Uh, to to try to to help with that, but then there's others that are all anxiety and no faith and think it's all on me and I I have to control it all. But reality tells us differently, and so that again we we kind of fall apart with the anxi anxiety side on that. Yeah, that's so interesting because I I think I was trying to imagine where you would put <clears throat> faith into these these pairings of polarities, and I was imagining maybe it's maybe that is the synthesis of of control and acceptance like maybe that the the balance of that looks like faith or maybe it's doubt i think a lot of people probably pair it with doubt so would you pair it with anxiety like where how do you no, think that's a faith great fits question in? Aubrey. great question and and the tricky part is we're dealing with some semantic issues right yeah. And yeah how are we defining our terms right and i mean even doubt is a really great one to really wrestle with semantically because in scripture the lord never has a nice thing to say about doubt but in reality, doubt is what, as, def as defined in a certain way, is what allows space for faith to function, right? Right. And so, need so a lot of this, and I've sometimes said, if you want to work with and wrestle with proving contraries, find a really good thesaurus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because part of our challenge is, what are we meaning by faith? <clears throat> okay. Uh, because there can be, and, and, and you can do the same with love, for example. Because to me, charity is one of the one of the great higher unifying principles. To borrow a phrase from Elder Elder Hafen, uh, it's it's a contrary that's already been proven. I had a friend that reached out and texted me once and said, "What's the contrary of charity?" And as I was wrestling with that, because I couldn't think of one, like what does charity need to balance itself out? 
So I ran the experiment. Okay, put charity on steroids. And do I still want it? Yes, I do. <laughs> right? Charity mm -hmm. never faileth. And that's what it tipped me off. Oh, charity must already be approving of contraries, mm -hmm. where you've brought together justice and mercy. You've brought together law and love. Uh, and I think in terms of faith, I think faith could be, as you're describing it, this higher unifying principle of how much can I really do? And I'm going to do that. But how much am I trusting in God? Uh, but that's a faith that in that includes our participation in it. Mm -hmm. So again, if I'm defining faith as that's only God's <clears throat> part, then I need works, my part to help balance it. Yeah. If it's faith in terms of God's got this, then I need a little anxiety of, but I wonder if he wants me to step up and do some things on my side too, yeah. right? So uh, I, th I think there's, this is some higher order thinking, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's going to be necessary on our part to wrestle with those exact kinds of questions, Aubrey, yeah. of, of is this the higher one? Am I in the right place? And often it's a matter of being sufficiently self-aware and self-regulating. I mean, the body is always trying, aiming for homeostasis, right? And how do I self, you know, regulate body temperature and a little heat, a little cold? How am I doing this? Uh, blood, when does it clot? When does it not? If it clots when it shouldn't, you die. If it doesn't clot <laughs> when it should, you die. And it's like, ah, oh, I better find this, this, this golden mean. And... Uh, and yeah, and so I think depending on the situation, faith could have a lot of contraries. That makes yeah. so much sense. It's just helpful to have language, I think. When you, yeah. when you don't have language around polarities or contraries or mm -hmm. what you're trying to prove, I think it, it stays kind of gray and hard to, right, hard to right. define. It's really useful to just say, oh, this is what I'm sensing. Like, these things are both true. Exactly. You know? Well, and I think the, it, it gives us pause before we lean all in right. on one side of an issue. Yeah, uh, It's helped, like I said, it's helped me politically, it's helped me spiritually and religiously, economically, personal relationships. Uh, it just gives you a chance to, to be a little more cautious, a little more careful, a little more patient, and like I said, self-aware. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned briefly law and love mm -hmm. as, we, um, as, as you were talking. And that's one where, uh, to be totally honest, I have not seen, I have not seen those as polarities mm -hmm. necessarily yeah. like my my view has been that law um as imperfectly as we understand it is sort of necessarily an expression of of god's love uh -huh. like any like any law that that god would give would be intended a manifestation of his a love, manifestation yeah. of his love but yeah. it's intended for us to to uh, live meaningful lives and eventually get to a place where we love mm -hmm. as god does and so i don't i don't see those necessarily as polarity but we maybe and, and it's sort of combined with the fact that you're saying charity is maybe that one that you can put on steroids and just ramp it all the way up and you're never going to go wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying, lo aren't love and charity synonyms? You know in, what I mean? In the right way, yes. Yeah. And this goes back to the semantic challenge. <clears throat> yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my uh, academic work uh, is in anti-religious rhetoric. And so when it comes to rhetoric, how am I using words and how am I you know, how, am I defining them in the same way as my audience? There's actually a, a rhetorical term called an ideograph. And an ideograph is a, a, a term that is very vaguely defined, if defined at all. But it sort of makes sense in the, in the public mind especially. But it has so much cultural capital that if you can trademark it as your own, so to speak, it will do all the heavy lifting of your arguments or lack thereof. Mm. And so wow. what ends up happening, so my dissertation was on Thomas Paine and the way he attacked the Bible. And he was such an incredible rhetorician that what did he say to try to convince an American population that centuries of monarchy made no sense at all? He wrote a book and he called it Common Sense. Hmm. And Common Sense was an ideograph in the, in the 18th wow. century to, because it was so ill-defined what was common sense? I mean, the co Scottish common sense realists were very careful on how they defined it, but nobody else was. And so it was like, well, we all agree with this, so it must be common sense. And if you can claim common sense as your own, then you've just absurdified your opposition. Mm -hmm. And so when he says, it makes no sense that we should be go governed by a king. And by labeling it common sense, people are like, oh, he's right. Mm -hmm. What were we thinking all these centuries? Right? He just turned... Per, uh, common sense on its head. Yeah. And then when he takes on Christianity, what's he name his book? The Age of Reason. And reason was another ideograph for the time uh, to say what I'm saying is reason. Reason is on my side. 
Uh, there's no reason on the side of revealed religion. So you've got to get away from it. And a lot of people did. Well, what's the reigning ideograph in our day? Love. love. And so when you take hashtag love wins as a rhetorical strategy, it does. Mm. And if you can trademark it, but again, what do you mean by love? It's so ill-defined. The Greeks were way better than the English as far as what kind of love are you talking about? And so when we say, uh, I mean, love wins, that's charity never faileth, it, that Paul would sign off on that. And so I think what you're describing, Tim, beautifully, is the higher unifying principle of love, call it charity. Again, in other translations of 1 Corinthians 13, they use love rather than charity as their term. But the way it's ill-defined or vaguely defined in modern culture, a love that has no limits, a love that can never <clears throat> say no. Uh, and and yeah. I think that's the concern that I would, would raise, okay. that, that divine love says yes and no, depending on the circumstance. The yeah. divine love, like you're pointing out, divine love is synonymous with divine law. Yeah. And, and in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord does an amazing job when he talks about, what is it, section 64, you have to forgive all men. Yeah. There's mercy speaking, right? There's the Lord of love. Yeah. But the amazing thing is, it, in the same breath, he talks about maintaining the sanctity of the sacraments. And you'll, you need to forgive everyone, but I not, I'm not necessarily going to because I have to exercise justice along the same way. Wait, I'm just going to do it rather than having you do it because you're not as good at proving contraries as I am. Yeah. And then he's, and because he says... L l lest you offend your lawgiver. Yeah. And so in the same revelation where he says, you must not offend the Lord of, lo of love, he then adds, and you can't afford to offend the Lord of law. Yeah. And so to, I think seeing him as the personification, the embodiment of, of proving every set of contraries, if you want to do it right, be like Jesus. But even that's tricky where it's, well, would Jesus be just or merciful? in this situation yeah would it would he would he say yes or no based on his perfect love and perfect law yeah no that makes sense and i think if i were to use my personal vernacular in order to like make this make sense to me mm -hmm. then i think you know quote unquote well this is a loaded word too actually but like if you called it if you called it tolerance and law then i actually do agree that um we should be we should be tolerant in many cases mm -hmm. but it needs to be tempered like mm -hmm. if um you know if someone if i don't really love this example, but if a child comes to you and says, hey, mom and dad, I'm a murderer. Like, you don't need to, you don't need to tolerate that or <laughs> right, I want to be right. a murderer. Like, there are, there are certainly limits. Right. Um, but I also recognize that even what I'm saying right now um, can be and has been weaponized against LGBTQ folks totally, for totally. a long time. Like, and you talk about this pendulum swing um, where I, I do feel like even today, perhaps, depending on the, the culture that you're a, you're a part of, the, the pendulum... Ha Ha, has been and might still be really far on the side of love. And so like, I think this is something Aubrey and I struggle with, but we, yeah, I think we are constantly, you know, swinging a little bit toward the the tolerance yeah. side because well, we've lacked that and in, I think, my, in my opinion. Yeah. I think it, yeah. something that you just barely said is what, what stood out to me is that, that it's perfect love and perfect law. And yeah. we're not really sure how to do either of those perfectly. Exactly. And so that that's where I think a lot of times it gets really muddy. Like it 100%. it looks dangerous to err on on an imperfect version of either one of those. Well, that's why yeah. I love in the lectures on faith when when it's describing these are the characteristics, the characteristics, the attributes, the perfections of deity. And among the list are included justice and mercy. But right in between them is judgment. And to me, I, that they all ha and, and the great thing about lectures on faith is Joseph's pushing, saying, if any of these attributes are missing from God, there goes your chance to exercise saving faith in him. A God without justice is whimsical and you can't trust him and you don't know what, where he's always moving the goalposts. It's like, no, I need something set in stone. But a God without mercy, well, there goes my chances. Mm -hmm. But because those two are situation specific, judgment is such an important one that God knows exactly where, where to strike the balance in a, in a given circumstance. And I, I agree with you, Aubrey, that God is perfect justice and perfect mercy and perfect judgment to balance the two. I think we stink at all three. Yeah. You know, that <laughs> yeah. I think I, at least I do. And yeah. as a parent, it's so often the case of, I think I'm supposed to be just this time. And then that totally backfires and blows yeah. up in my face. I'm like, ah, I guess I was supposed to be merciful. But other times it's like, okay, was I too merciful? 
and I think by by at least in our mind, proving contraries doesn't make any of this easy, but it gives us a mental framework of of knowing where I'm supposed to be aiming at least, right? And and I have this spectrum that I can move laterally across, back and forth, trying to find the better balance. And I think the challenge of contraries, like we've been saying, is we're typically wired for success on one side of it, mm -hmm. which makes us almost inherently weaker at its opposite. And so some people are really good at honor and agency and scared to death to to raise a concern. And so to me, it's again, situation specific in this circumstance, I'm probably gonna get this wrong. Uh, I'm gonna do the best I can at striking the balance. Yeah. And I think honestly, I've had conversations with people, if they know that I'm really, really trying to strike a balance, they cut me some slack. They, they offer me grace. And if I say, last time we talked, I'm so concerned about your feelings and just wanting to maintain a friendship. I love you so much. I, I'm afraid that I didn't do justice to justice. Mm -hmm. And so if you'll be patient with me, I'm going to try to just be, to take a little step in the uh, other direction. The moment you feel me overcorrecting, tell me, because mm -hmm. I don't want to hurt any feelings or offend you, but I'm afraid I offended a truth that I know. Yeah, and I need to bring that up. Okay, what you said there is interesting to me. I I, I think we're very close to the same page here. It, there, it may just be my my inner millennial coming out a little bit. <laughs> um, the the I, when you talk about erring on the side of mercy, to be honest, that does resonate most with me. And mm -hmm. I think totally. the reason and you and you said it. You said like usually that's the case. Yep. Um, but I think one of the reasons is, um that it's it it comes back almost to an epistolo epistemological question for mm -hmm. me, which is I am in doubt about what I know about the law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like there are certain things that I am I am very clear on, but there are other things that I haven't figured out for myself yeah, yet. Yeah. And so even if even if I'm leaning somewhere and I'm in relationship with another person who sees it who sees it differently, I am I am hesitant to impose uh my law on them that I'm mm -hmm. somewhat uncertain about. Yeah. And so then it it becomes it seems to become important to me to sort of accept that they they may have insights that I don't have mm -hmm. yeah. on this and therefore mercy and love sort of become the only option. Does that make right. sense? What yeah, well, and that's why I love just conversations like this, mm -hmm. you know, to really talk and understand where the other person is coming from. Uh, I, because I spend so much time with one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that are really wrestling with difficult issues, uh, whether or not they'll maintain faith in anything and what I love about proving contraries is it gives me a chance to validate where they're coming from and empathize with the, the struggle and the wrestle. It's hard. Mm -hmm. Balance always is. Yeah. As I remember one class I was talking about this and one student just said, this sounds exhausting. <laughs> uh, and I could feel the pain behind the comment. And it's like, yeah, it is until we get better at it. And I'm not saying I'm there yet, uh, but there have been times where I've tried to teach two sides of an issue and trying my very best. And I'll sometimes say, I don't know if you can see my six pack through my, <laughs> through my white shirt, but I am flexing every muscle I have to try to balance this. Uh, it's, it's hard, but people deserve our best efforts. I do want to, I want to ask you about a couple, we were thinking about what are some others. Yeah. One that came to mind for me was I don't have a, I don't have a very uh, succinct way to say this, but the sort of the concept of grit versus like psychological safety. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the idea that um, we do need to tough some things out. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get up when we fall. We need to be able to listen to uh, opposing ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and you think of sort of the stereotype, which I think is true in a lot of cases of the modern university, where uh -huh. we're we're no longer even we're you know shouting down speakers that come to campus who. Yeah. Um, who a representative viewpoint that you don't agree with um, there, but there, I think there is some virtue too to, um, to that concept of psychological safety where there are actually truly toxic situations mm -hmm, totally. that we need to, uh, that we need to avoid. Any thoughts on, on this one in particular? Well, one example again, goes back to the Jaredite barges that you've got these two holes and uh, you got to let air in, but you don't want to let water in. And I think there's a certain sense of, I mean, or even 
go back to high school biology class, the semi-permeable membrane, right? <laughs> uh, of what am I going to let in and what am I going to keep out? And that's a contrary. And and what? How open am I to other perspectives that are di that differ from my own? But also knowing when to close that hole because water's starting to come in. Uh, if you think about creation, that there is a firmament created, and and there's an atmosphere, and what is it letting in? Light that's necessary for life, but also what is it keeping out that would be harmful? And balancing that, there's the exclusivity, inclusivity. Contrary, you see that in the Abrahamic covenant, that in thee and in thy seed, that's very close-minded. That's very uh, non-ecumenical, right? It's I'm, I'm, a, I'm a chosen people. And in our post-colonial age, that those are those are fighting words. We, we don't want any sense of exclusivity. But then the next phrase, in thee and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And there's radical inclusivity. And so I think if I'm, again, so much of it is self-regulation and self uh, awareness of how am I doing right now in this conversation? Is it pushing me to expand my understanding and to empathize with my opposite and and s help point out something that's in my own ideological blind spot? On the other hand, this is damaging and triggering, and and I need to I need to step away from this. And I think sometimes again we can step out of a situation and really think and try to understand where am I in this specific circumstance. Yeah. That makes okay. Sense. One that I really like that I'd love for you to touch on is the iron rod versus Leona. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That one, uh, Richard Pohl, I think years ago is the first that used them as metaphors for types of thinkers uh, and, and beers in the church. And the iron rod is much is I mean, basically that's stage one sp spirituality or three, if you're a fowler. Uh, and, and the Liahona is more of the second stage complexity and or the fall with all of its ambiguity and the spindles are moving and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't and the words are changing and ah, what do I do with this? <laughs> uh, another way to a similar uh, contrary that you can superimpose over that one is the letter of the law, spirit of the law. And the letter of the law sounds more like an iron rod. It's fixed, it's stable, it's unbending, unmoving, whereas the spirit of the law is more Liahona like. And I think I'm, when I first read Paul, I was I was grateful for the analogy, a little concerned that he was assigning it to people that uh, it seemed that way to me anyway, that, well, you're either a, a Leahona Latter-day Saint or you're just mm -hmm. an iron rod Mormon and and you need to have some flexibility. You could tell he was definitely leaning in the Leahona direction, understandably so. Whereas to me, rather than labeling people like that, I think it's safer and wiser to label principles like that. And there are certain iron rod principles that are just fixed and unmoving and, and that's that's how God is asking us to live. And there are other principles that are Liahona-like and there's some flexibility or some ambiguity. And I, to me, what's fascinating in First Nephi 16, when the Liahona is first discovered, <clears throat> it comes only a verse or two after Nephi and Lehi have proven absolute obedience to every commandment of God. Mm. And, I, and the timing to me is perfect, that once you've mastered the iron rod, now you're ready for a Liahona. But there will be times where the Liahona points back to the iron rod and says, grab it, this one is a principle that's fixed. Uh, and I think too often we use the spirit of the law as some kind of self-justification -just for completely abolishing the letter of the law. When typically it's the spirit of the law is meant to increase and sanctify our our obedience and and allow for the exceptions to the rule that the rule giver gives us. We just had this great conversation with Steve Young about his new book and mm -hmm. he, the way he talks about this is is um are like are are we thinking in a transactional way? Because as soon as we can adjust the way that we think and, it, and we kind of change that orientation, then the law sort of become has its own gravitational pull because it's it the the gravitational pull is is created by love and love yeah. love will find itself in the law. But but that looks so different, I think, than like this what I picture letter of the law feeling like, which right. is marching with orders yeah, and yeah, yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. very rigid and no feeling. And I I love this idea that. They're, they're, they can be one in the same, but one is totally not transactional and doesn't need anything in return because it is completely wholly about yeah. love. Well, then you've shifted from the transactional to the relational. Yeah. Which is really what we're trying to, what the Lord's trying to accomplish with all of us anyway. Covenant is relational, far more than transactional. And, and to see what the Lord's trying to develop with all of us 
is that beautiful relational kind of connection to him. Mm -hmm. and, and it's with that that we'll know, because it's relationship, when to shift to the left or when to shift to the right and how much mercy in this situation or a little bit more justice here. Uh, but that takes, again, the relationships, really knowing another person. Uh, I had a student that stayed after class one day and just said to me, Brother Halverson, you're one of the best teachers I've ever had, but I leave class with no hope every, every time. And I was so devastated by that comment. I said, please, can you, do you have time to stay and talk? Because I want to hear where you're coming from. We, I need relationship on this one to understand. And based on his background, which was devastating, and just no love and no support growing up and just feeling like he had no place and nobody cared for him, his, he had been wired to hear justice the pin of justice, you know, sounded so loudly even when it dropped from a distance. And he was tone deaf to any language of mercy. I, I, I sense that as people read the Old Testament. And they only hear the, the justice of God. And mercy is found throughout that beautiful book. And, and again, with a relationship to understand where someone's coming from, I let him know <laughs> Every, t every class period, I'm trying to teach justice and mercy. Every class period, I have two different audiences, and I'm trying to meet the needs of both. You are so far on one side of this, and I understand why. Please know that anytime the justice side comes up in class, it's not intended for you. Yeah. I love that. And, and I love the idea that when you're reading the scriptures, like you're going to see, mm -hmm. you're going to see scriptures who are for people who, who need to move over to the mercy side. And you're going to yeah. see scriptures for people who need to move over to the justice side. And it's so helpful to have this paradigm so that you can kind of be sifting and exactly. sorting instead of feeling confused or, well, or. Exactly. Some people even complain that the scriptures seem to be self-contradictory. Yeah. It's like, well, welcome to the definition of a paradox, right? <laughs> right. And they need not to be self-contradictory because it, it's situation specific. Mm -hmm. And in this given moment, you need to be told that as often as my people repent, I will forgive them. Wow. Versus in this situation, you need to be told that I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. And, and again, it's going to take, we can't be lazy on this one. We can't just sit on our side of the of the teeter totter and assume that hey, I'm I'm on the straight and narrow. It's like it was too easy to stay on one extreme, just like it's too easy for your opposite to stay on their side. Mm -hmm. I have to pray hard in this moment. Am I being too just with myself or being too merciful with myself? I I was talking to a friend who was going through something really hard and blamed himself entirely for it, and had scriptural justification because the verse that he kept coming to his mind was, "Lord, is it I?" Mm -hmm. And I, was he partially to blame for his circumstance? Yes, but not entirely to blame. And that's when I remembered that in one of the gospel accounts of the Last Supper, it's not Lord, is it I? It's Lord, who is it? Uh, I mean, Judas is looking a little shifty over there. Uh, <laughs> and they're, they're, it's not, we don't quote that one though, because it's not altruistic. We love the version of Lord, is it I? But in that circumstance, I was so grateful that there is an alternate possibility. And I'm sure both actually were happening. That sounds like human nature. Like, I don't, could it be? No, it couldn't be. But it may, I, you know, and so wrestling with this and to, for him to give him a verse uh, on, the, on equal authority with a verse that he was using as a club to beat himself, to say, there are times where you have to ask, are, who else is to blame here? And, and, and that was something that was a, a help to him. I really love that. And I, I kept thinking, hearing you talk about this, that this is just such a um, recipe for healing for, you know, we're, we're just so polarized in so mm -hmm. many situations in, in around the world, but, but it's so easy to demonize people yeah. who disagree with you when you, when you believe that you're right. And so this just feels like such a gift because it's a way to see that someone else could have a, could, could be making different decisions that are also totally rooted in a different value. Yeah. So I'd love for you to walk us through that exercise of exploring your, and I think this is, this would be so helpful in very personal relationships mm -hmm. where you can look at something that you feel very strongly, or maybe it's something that you're very good at and like flipping to the other side of the yeah. coin. Like how, how can, how can that help us in, in these personal conflicts? Yeah. The coin, I'm glad you brought that up. That's, I love the analogy because there's a heads and a tails. There's a, mm. a strength and a weakness side. And like we said with Ether 12 and with Elder Oaks, strengths to weakness, weakness to strength. It's just the coins flipping back and forth. And 
And that first step of whether it's self-awareness, because I'm trying to make sense of where I'm coming from, or personal relationships, where is this other person coming from? If we understand that it's a coin I'm looking at, then we'll be more aware there's going to be a positive and a negative dimension to it. So if I'm trying to be self-aware, and let's say I'm wired for uh, pride is my problem, or in a, on, a, on a better day, it's just self-confidence. Right? Right. <laughs> um, then what do I? What then? What draws my attention are my my heads. I'm always focused on my heads. Like, look how many amazing heads I have in this whole set of coins. Then, if you're self-aware and courageous, <laughs> try to flip the coin. And again, the easiest way to do it is to think, here's what I'm good at. Put it on steroids. Does that scare me a bit or does it scare other people? Oh, yeah, it does. No wonder. OK, uh, I'm this and I tend towards that as a result. Darn it. OK, uh, if I'm more of the self-deprecating type, then it's my tails that are always facing me and haunting me. Then have the courage to turn it over and realize, oh, but that's what makes me good at that. Now, I don't just mean I'm good over here but bad over there. I'm not saying I'm, I'm a, a lousy parent, but I'm a really good cook. Uh, no, that, those are unrelated. But if I'm thinking I'm uh, a very sensitive and emotional and present kind of person, that's wonderful. Hold to that same coin and flip it to its tails and think, oh, I might be too indulgent. I might not have any limits and boundaries and I'm getting sucked dry by emotional vampires. Uh, my wife and I talk about this often because we're a pretty good set of contraries. We have different coins <laughs> uh, and she is incredibly sensitive, but sometimes that gets her feelings hurt and I'm not sensitive as much, but that sometimes leads me uh, to be unfeeling uh, of other people's circumstances. I'm, I'm working on that and she's working on hers and together we're trying to get better. Uh, so to me, there's something about looking at the coin, recognizing, and again, interpersonal relationships, same thing. If you have a roommate that frustrates you or a mission companion you couldn't get along with or your spouse or child is driving you crazy, it's because there's a tails that's usually bumping up against one of your tails, to be mm -hmm. honest. But there's a tails of a coin. Do the work, the mental work exercise to find the head that it's that is intimately associated with it. That I wouldn't I wouldn't get rid of that attribute despite its ne negative possibilities because the positives are absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And I don't want to lose that. Yeah. And then to find the contrary coin. That's the thing where coins now become contraries, where knowing this attribute has a heads and a tails, I need a contrary attribute. And granted, it'll have its own heads and tails. But by coupling them together, it's almost like magnets that kind of click into, into place and keep each other from spinning wildly. Because this side, if I can develop that other attribute, it'll keep this one in check. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, the, my favorite place to see it, speaking of interpersonal relationships, is Alma and Shiblon in Alma 38, where I always suggest to my students, it's a short chapter, you can do this. Read it three times. Mm -hmm. And the first round through those 15 verses, just look for Shiblon's strengths. They're beautiful, and there's plenty of them. The second round, read the potential negatives that are inherent within those strengths. And once you have eyes to see, they start jumping off the page. And it's like, whoa, be ca careful, careful, son, careful, son. <laughs> and that's exactly what Alma is doing with his son, who's awesome, but awesome with potential for being not so awesome if the tail, if the head stip flips the, the tails. And then the third time, then what advice does dad give son to help him stay in balance? Uh, you're so good. Be careful that your boldness doesn't turn to overbearance. You are so passionate about what you know to be true. Bridle that passion so you can be filled with love. Uh, be diligent. You've already got that one down. And temperate. That's where you struggle in all things. And I think if we can do that with ourselves in the mirror, and if we can do that with our loved ones or our conversation partners or our political opponents or whatever it might be, we'll value them for where they're coming from because it keeps... I said this once to a group of people that didn't like me, uh, that I was stepping into a situation where I was the personification of institutional Mormonism. And it was a bunch of people that did not have any good feelings about institutional Mormonism. And I just remember 
thanking them for being different from me and letting them know based on my study of Puritan history and early pioneer history, I said, thank you for being different from me because it helps keep me from being, from getting weird. <laughs> uh, and I think, when, especially with social media and these echo chambers that are created, we only hear from the like-minded. It pushes mm -hmm. us further and further to the extreme. We don't have any conversation partners on the other side to alert us to our, t our t the tails of our coin or to show us the heads of their coin. And that's why I want to put myself into some of those difficult circumstance situations and, and potentially, you know, relationships with potential friction because it, it softens in ways that I need to be softened. It keeps me from becoming extreme in places I shouldn't. It, it helps me prove contraries. I totally agree. And it's such an interesting exercise. Even if you're just scrolling through social media, when you, when you get snagged by something that mm -hmm. kind of bothers you to just like pause and, and ask yourself like, what, it, what is it exactly? And yeah. you know, for me, I have, I think one of my tails sizes, I, I am sensitive. Like it's very hard for me. I would, I would always prefer any other solution than having a confrontation. Yeah. Like I just, I, I can't, I hate it. And so when someone else is very good at that, when someone else feels passionate enough to have an opinion mm -hmm. and to put it out there, like that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. And it, it's a gift to be able to recognize that I'm feeling sensitive because that is my sensitivity. Like that is something that I am working on and I can respect that that is the, the that's a polarity that mm -hmm. they're very comfortable with. And it's, and it's healing or, and useful to discover what polarity would help mm -hmm. be healing for me, yeah. you know? And to recognize them, maybe they aren't doing the polarity very well, but they have a side of the polarity that's that really is healthy strong. and yeah, good. And, and yes. Necessary. Yeah. And, and me and then, too. Yeah. yeah exactly. That I like, I, I'm a peacemaker and like, that's the head side of this. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I can make anything. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the tail side is uh, sometimes it's impossibly hard to say what I want and need. Yeah. But I love the idea that you that get, is you get good. Along with my wife and <laughs> yeah, I know when you described my wife, I was like, yeah, I get her. Like she's doing it the right way. Yeah. <laughs> like, but but it's it's useful to just have language. Like yes, this is good, and there's a healthy way. And like having a polarity will bring this into balance in yeah. a way that will be the most fruitful. Yeah, my kids roll their eyes now whenever I bring up the Goldilocks zone, because to me <laughs> that's where you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. And and once you find it, because you've brought in both sides of the of the equation, you've brought in both coins, the contraries and proven them, then you're no longer too hot nor too cold. You are in this place where life can thrive. And that's what we're after. Okay. To, to me, it, that's, that's the atonement stage in the stages of faith, mm. that creation has learned from fall and fall has, yes, transcended, but included the blessings of, of the garden. And together we go climb hand in hand up to the atonement. And to me, when I think of that stage, uh, when I think of a, a church, a, a nation, a community, a family that has navigated the stages and learned to prove contraries, that to me is millennial. That is, I mean, the definition of Zion, you're one heart and one mind. That's one side of the contrary. And you're dwelling in righteousness. Ooh, there's mm -hmm. the other side, you know? And so uh, somehow I'm able to live the, keep the commandments of God and live a righteous life, but with such unity. I mean, unity and orthodoxy. Jesus is moving them towards in third Nephi and finds its fulfillment in fourth Nephi uh, in, in powerful ways. And I, that's where I want to go. Yeah. That's a beautiful, that's beautiful place to wrap up. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Jared. Really oh, appreciate my, your work on this. Your pleasure. voice, it's really, really valuable. It's something so, we so need good right to meet, now. to meet people that are proving contraries themselves. And, and, <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> and, we, and we all are, you know, and I, at least we all should be. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Jared Halverson. And a big thanks to Jared for coming on the podcast. If you'd like to hear more from Jared, make sure to register now for Restore, the Faith Matters Gathering taking place on October 7th and 8th in Salt Lake City. If Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read all of the reviews and it really helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters and we appreciate the support. Thanks for listening. Remember, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.